Hi, I'm Krista West, and I am the designer and owner of Avlia Mediterranean Folk Embroidery, and this is another floss tube um, where I'm going to just chat a little bit about embroidery, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like to work at home with kids. Um, my entire career, I've actually worked at home with kids and for the last 22 years, and so this whole COVID thing and everybody being home and having to work at home with kids and all that kind of stuff and juggle that, um, that's pretty much been my entire professional life. So I've got some tips and some ideas for you and some things like that to talk about. But before I begin, I just want to give you my stuff. And so if you want to follow more uh, about Avlia or about me, my creative work, you can follow me on Instagram at Krista M. West. And I post a lot of different stuff, but it, it all tends to be under a textile kind of general theme of Mediterranean textiles, art history, that kind of stuff. You can also find me on Facebook. Bear with me. I actually only just have had a Facebook account for three weeks. I know you guys are like, what? And I'm like, yes. Um, so that's new. And I'm still figuring out how all the messaging and stuff like that works. So bear with me. But you can also look at me, look at my stuff on Facebook at Avalia Folk Embroidery. And then the best way to see my work and get latest updates and all of that stuff is the Avlia website. And that's www.avlia, it's A-V-L-E-A -E dot life. Avlia in Greek means courtyard, and it's where people would have embroidered, uh, where women would have sat and embroidered. So that's why we're called Avlia. So today I'm really excited to share with you a brand new design. It's actually, I just put it on the Avlia website yesterday, so it's up and ready to go, and I'm really excited. So, this new design is called Athenian Compass. This is a new meditative slash all-over repeating design. Really beautiful. Now, this is the large runner. I'm going to talk about this in a minute because I've got a really exciting new thing to offer with this pattern. This design is is comprised of circles and arrows. This one is actually worked, my daughter actually worked this one. Um, doesn't she embroider beautifully? And this is actually worked on legacy linen in coconut macaroon 30 count with DMC uh, 310 black, 355 terracotta, and 832 golden olive. Now, due to COVID supply delays, we can't get the legacy linen in the coconut macaroon but I have it in the custard cream, which is a really similar color. And so that's what I'm substituting for kits, basically until the coconut macaroon gets back in stock. So then the other, the other, the other exciting thing about, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this pattern in just a minute, but also we're offering this as a bit kit. So one of our cute little bit kits, there it is right there. Same, worked on the same colors, but a different background fabric. So this background fabric is called Mikini, and it is a specialty fabric that I import from Greece. It's one of the more traditional fabrics that counted thread work is done on in Greece. It is a mercerized cotton. With mercerization is a process that's done to cotton to make it receive dyes better. And it gives it this really amazing, very crisp finish, almost a little bit of sheen to it. This is the Sakari color. The color is called sakari. Sakari in Greek means raw sugar. So if you ever go to a restaurant or a coffee shop and there's little sugar in the raw packets that sit on the table and you dump one out, okay, that's the color of this fabric. The color of raw sugar. That's actually a color name in Greek, which I think is really cool. Um, and a kind of common one, especially with embroidery, because some of the older stuff tends to be done on this more sort of, it's almost like kind of an aged ivory color. If you're looking for a more sort of Western terminology, it's really cool. But the fabric itself is awesome. If you've been working on our traditional ground cloth, which is a 26 count fabric, and it's really easy to see the threads, and you wanna move, take the next step up kind of in your stitching journey, and you want to be working on the higher count fabrics, like a 30 count, the, the Mikini is an awesome place to start. The threads are so crisp and so even, it's very easy to see the threads when you're counting over two threads. Um, in fact, I always tell people when they when they ask either through our website or through Etsy or things like that, I'll say, you know, try on the traditional ground cloth first and then the next step up, work something on Mickey and then move on to like a legacy linen. 
um, that's kind of a good trajectory for learning to work on counted thread. So this is a really cute little um, bit kit. The Mickey also does drawn thread hem beautifully, so easy. Now the kit um, includes the full the full color pattern with an SOC symbol on color chart, and then it comes with the Mickey fabric, a John James needle, and DMC floss. And a note about the DMC floss: we hand wind all of our kits floss. Um, you won't ever get our kits with like little just pre-made hanks of DMC floss. I happened to notice early on when I was doing floss research um, and just by the by DMC floss is still like the number one like floss used increase for traditional embroidery because it's color fast, it's washable, durable. Um, there's a lot to love about it. Um, it was funny. I was a little bit of a floss snob <laughs> until I started doing this and then I really came to appreciate uh, what a great floss DMC six strand embroidery floss is. But I buy it on the 2000 meter cones and I started noticing that the floss on the cones was just a little different than what's in the little hanks. It's got a little bit more sheen. The other nice thing about it too is you don't have those crinks in it from the hank. So you don't get those little kind of um, almost little rounded ends because with this, we're just winding straight off. Actually, when I say winding, it's my daughter and I, my 10 year old and I, we sit here and wind off, you know, yards of floss at a time when we're making kits. So that's what's in, that's what's in a bit kit. Now the bit kits are basically just smaller versions of my other designs because not everybody wants a really big embroidery project all the time. Originally, I designed these with kind of beginners in mind, just for people to kind of put their toe, you know, in, in, in the water of counted thread embroidery. But I've been surprised and pleased to find out how many um, experienced stitchers uh, buy these too. And it's nice because, you know, it's nice to like keep, you know, one in your car if you get into a traffic jam, you know, or back when we all like travel on airplanes, you know, I'd always have one in my bag so I could have at least a little bit of embroidery. They can make nice gifts. Um, they're really, really great. And I'm not going to tell you this, but if you're interested in big kits, you probably want to sign up for the, uh, the email newsletter because tomorrow we're going to be releasing a little special on bit kits that might be of interest to you. So, so that's the bit kit of Athenian Compass. But here's what's really cool about the Athenian Compass um, full size pattern. Okay, so this is the bit kit, the little small kit, and this is the full size pattern. Now, my professional career has been as a tailor and, and very much in the sewing trades in the sewing industry. And in professional tailoring, we use a concept called grading all the time. And it's basically that you make something smaller or bigger. And as I was doing cross stitch patterns, I was really struck by the fact that everything is always made to one size. And I'm like, well, wait, a lot of these designs, it's very easy to make things larger or smaller, but you gotta do all this pesky math. You've gotta like figure out how much more floss you need and figure out exactly how big your piece of fabric should, should be. And you know, a lot of stitchers just hate doing that math. And I realized that when I was inputting the design into my cross stitch software, it's quite easy for me to run all the calculations. So that's what I did. So let me walk you through how this pattern works because I will be releasing a, no a number of my upcoming designs. Oh, let me grab you a sneak peek one in just a minute here. I'm gonna sneak around the camera, it's my ironing board. Um, for example, this is a new design that's gonna release, I'm not exactly sure when, but soon. This is the Santorini Stars. And it's going to come also as a multi-size pattern. And then we have another one coming up called Melianthus Border. That's going to release as a multi-size pattern. So what exactly is a multi-size pattern? Okay, first page of pattern, cover photo, back page is all your info, okay? Then on page three is your close-up working chart. This is your chart for actually working the design. And so, you know, you start in the upper corner and you know you work your design. Now... On page four, the last page, what I've done is I've actually given you the sketch for each size that you can work in this design. Now, I mean, if you want to make something totally different, then like knock yourself out. I mean, those of you who know how to do the math and do the repeats and all that kind of stuff. But for a lot of you, that's kind of a new skill. And we can talk about that in another video because that's a really good skill to know how to do math for cross stitch. But I thought it would be helpful to basically talk about this. So. And then, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention is on the cover page is also all the calculations. So you can see that right here. So basically, if you want to make the small runner, 
it tells you you need this size, this amount of fabric. And then you go over here and you look at the DMC floss and you're like, you want to run the small runner, you need this much fabric. If you want the large runner, you need this size piece of fabric and you need these yardages of floss. If you want the small cushion cover or table mat, then you can, you know, everything's right here. So the pattern tells you basically how to make four different sizes of the thing. Because some of you, you know, maybe you already have a table runner and you want a pillow cover. Um, I wanted to present patterns that had as many options as possible for using like throughout your home. And so like, for example, I have a lot of table runners. I do a lot of table runners because I really like those and I, you know, change them out my house and put them in different places. But I also really, really like cushion covers. And actually, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start talking um, soon about cushion covers. I'm just figuring out the back end of trying to figure out the support of of helping of, of designing some sort of cushion backing kit, so that those of you who don't have sewing machines don't have to worry about that part. So I'm working on that. Stay tuned. But like for example, this design actually would look. Real. This is Byzantine rondelle, and it would look really, really cool just as like you know a square table mat, you know. But it also looks really, really cool as a, a really just nifty pillow. Um, Grecian art, uh, Grecian stripe is another one that's that way. Would look great. This would also look really great as like a nice long kind of almost minimalist table runner. But it looks great as a cushion cover. Um, Santorini stars. This one that I just mentioned that's coming out soon. This one will also be a multi-size pattern and it will actually come in a small runner that basically has just the design down the middle that one's like really easy it's only like seven thousand stitches so it's about twice the stitching amount of like a bit kit so it's really it's really achievable and then it also comes in it's going to come in this is the small table mat or cushion cover i photographed it both ways and then there's a larger cushion cover and then a larger runner so again you have a lot of options um it's really important to me as a designer that I give you the stitcher as much value as possible in your pat in your patterns in my in my patterns for you. Um, I want to try and give you as much information as much technical support as I can. And I hadn't seen anyone do anything like this in the cross stitch world. This idea of multi size patterns. So whenever I have patterns that are available that that really lend themselves well to that adaptation, I'm going to do that. I do have some, like some designs, like I'm working on Melianthus border right now, which is oh, it's just stunning. It's this really cool, Melianthus in Greek means honey bush. And it's this beautiful leaf pattern that scrolls and then it rotates and scrolls again. So when I tried to make it a square, oh my word, it was a flop, it totally flopped. But I'm gonna do it as like two sizes of like runners because it, like it can, you can easily do that. But the nice thing about the multi-size patterns is that you're not having to do all that pesky math. It's like already been done. You basically just, and then you buy the right amount of fabric, you buy the right amount of floss, you follow the pattern, you're good to go. And then we'll do these as some sizes will be done as kits. I won't, I mean, unless I get requests for it, I probably won't do a kit for every single size. Most of them I'll do a kit for like the small runner and like the small square. That's how we'll do it. And then, but the larger ones are there if you want to take on a larger project. So, that is Athenian Compass, which is a really, really great design. And you can find those. Those are on the Avlio website right now and also on my Etsy shop if you prefer to shop on Etsy. Now, before I launch into talk a little bit about working from home with kids, um, I'm also going to give you a little sneak peek because these are so great. I actually decided to not wait till October to release them. So, I think I'm going to release them in two weeks. This is my new Ukrainian crisscross. And this will be a bit kit um, in either red or blue. And it will be a library edition pattern. So for those of you who haven't tuned into previous episodes, my library edition patterns are a full size pattern uh, that's charted for the way the original textile was laid out. And in this case, true story, this is actually from a plastic shopping bag that a friend of mine sent me from Kiev. No joke, cracks me up every time I think about it. Can you imagine living someplace where embroidery is such a thing that they print it on plastic shopping bags? Whew. I was like, I was like ready to move to Kiev. Like, okay, let's go. Um, but these, okay, so Ukrainian work, there's a lot of shared design motifs and elements between Mediterranean work and like Ukrainian and Romanian and Balkan work. Um, they very much have kind of a shared history. They just are sort of like, they kind of come from the same trunk of a tree, but they go off in different branches. 
And one of the things that's really distinctive about Ukrainian work is that it's often worked in often worked in red and black on white. And the day I was making it, I was starting to like lay out all the colors for the sample. I just happened to have my Wedgwood blue cone sitting there on the table. I was making up kits and I was like, oh, my word, blue and black are just so gorgeous together. So I'm offering it in both a whoops. How about we show you the front side, the blue and black or the red and black. And then the library edition pattern too, which will also be a kit um, you can buy it. And it, it makes like a table runner. It makes a longer table runner. And this fabric is the white Mikini. So this is like the Mikini we were talking about before. This is the Sakari color, the, the raw sugar color. And this is the bright white. So if you're interested in the Ukrainian ones, which I just, I was so happy with how these came out. Just so, so sweet. Um, and the design is really pleasant to work. The other thing I really like about the Mikini is that it's very crisp stitch definition. I'm gonna see if I can get a little closer, but it's just really crisp, really, really nice. So that's coming up. So um, sign up on the on the Avlia website if you wanna be notified when, that, when these are coming out, probably about two weeks. So that's that. Now, for the last part of this video, I thought I would just kind of move a little bit away from the stitching world. So those of you who are like, I'm good, I'm done, fine, sign off now, you're all good. Thank you for joining me. But those of you who are really struggling with this whole work at home with kids in tow during COVID thing, let me talk to you for a little bit because I feel your pain. I have been there for a very, very, very long time. So when, um, when I started getting into my professional tailoring career, I never really expected it to be more than a hobby business. And then in 1998, um, my first daughter was born and that, and uh, just within a few months later, a friend of mine was a web designer back when that was like a brand new thing. And he asked me if he could use my, my, my tailoring stuff as sort of a guinea pig to build a guinea pig website so he could test theories. And I was like, sure. I didn't even have email. I didn't even know what he was talking about, to be honest, but he's a good friend. So I was like, okay, let's try it. And within two months, we were getting 1200 hits a month on my website and my business just took off. And I had never, I had never expected to be sort of a more or less full-time working mom when I had, when I had little kids, but that's kind of what transpired. So for the next, like, well, pretty much for the last 22 years, I have worked anywhere from 25 to about 80 hours a week, depending on where I've been, you know, depending on deadlines. I did a lot of speaking engagements for about five years. So I was frequently flying out on the weekend and speaking. Um, and that is very, this is all very, very challenging with kids. And during a lot of that, I homeschooled too, because we lived in a neighborhood that had really terrible schools. So anyways, let's talk about this for a bit. So the first thing I just want to really tell you is take a breath. This year is not going to make or break us, um, with our kids' education and, and as families. Uh, one of the things that I look back on um, and I regret is that I frankly just worried too much. And I worried that like my kids weren't getting what they needed. And I worried that I was working too much. And I worried about this and I worried about that. And looking back on it, you know what? If you love your kids and you try to do the best you can with your work, and but you do put your kids first, it's all gonna turn out. So first thing is just take a breath. This is not the year to be like creating amazing scholar children, okay? Um, this is a maintenance year. We want them to still be able to read in a year. We want them to be able to do math. You know, we want them to have the basics. And they're kids, they're flexible. They, they're, they're gonna roll with this. And I think the most important thing we can do for our kids is to also be flexible too. Now, I know for some of you who are type A's, you're like, yeah, no, no way, no thank you. So for those of you who are a little bit more, who like a little bit more structure and things like that, and people ask me all the time, how did you do it? Um, so here's the really important thing. I'm really about a practice as opposed to a routine slash schedule. I have set up probably no less than 500 different schedules over the last 20 years, and they always bomb. You know, it's like, okay, this week from 7.15 to 7.45, I'm going to do this. And from 8.15 to 8.45, I'm going to do this. You know what? That works to a point, but most of us get really burned out on schedules and feeling like there is a stopwatch around us all the time. A better way of looking at this is looking at, okay, what do I want to get done in the day? And so for me, I think 
what do I want to get done in the morning? And what do I want to get done in the afternoon? And what do I want to get done in the evening? And usually for me, the evening is all about like restoration. It's like, I, I try not to work too much in the evenings. I'm more of a morning person. Um, if you're more of an evening person, maybe your time to relax is more like in the mornings and that's kind of your slow wake up. So the idea behind having a practice is like knowing the things that are important to you that you need to get done that day. Like for me, part of my practice is orders. Um, the very first thing I do every morning when I come into the workshop is I fulfill all orders, orders that have come in. So I grab those kits, I make up any kits that are missing, I get those things out the door. And then I triage. And then I know my next step of my practice is to like deal with my email. And if you have trouble staying on track with this, your phone's timer can be awesome. When I'm really feeling like I'm a little bit more scattered or more distractible, I will set my phone for 45 minutes and I will say, okay, I have to get all my email done in 45 minutes. That trick works like wonders. Um, or you can say, okay, I've got to like do this thing or that thing and I'm going to give myself 45 minutes. Use a stopwatch as opposed to a schedule. Schedules just kind of tend to burn you out, but a stopwatch, that kind of idea can really help. Now, with kids in tow, this is why it's so important to have more of a practice as opposed to a routine. Because as we all know, schedules and routines just kind of go out the door with kids. You know, different things are different, different days and things like that. So try to set up kind of what your family's practice is. You know, are your people more morning morning um, people and they want to get up and you want to have an activity for your kids right off the bat? Or your kids like a little slower to wake up and you know, okay, I'm more of a morning person. My kids are need a little more time to wake up slow. I'm going to grab that first hour and a half and like get some work done. Um, I frequently did that. Um, I am a morning person. I know. Sorry for those of you who aren't, but I'm just a natural morning person. And so for a number of years, I would be in my workshop at six in the morning. Um, and my workshop was either in my backyard or it was in, now it's in my basement. And I would go out and I would work. And that's what I would do. And I would get a good solid hour and a half work done. Then it would be like, you know, 730 in the morning. I'd go in. My kids would be getting up. The other thing, too, that I'm really big on, that I've really been big on with my kids, and I think this is great. If you've not really been big on this, I would really, I'd encourage you to help your children learn skills. I, by the time my kids were six years old, they knew how to cook their own breakfast. It was a simple breakfast. Maybe it was a bowl of oatmeal in the microwave. Maybe it was peanut butter toast, something simple. But they all knew how to make their own breakfast uh, because when I was working from home, I couldn't both be like on the email and making their breakfast. The one, And so sometimes you have to pick and choose. And for me, what I always chose was the dinner meal. That was the important one for me. Okay, everybody can kind of scatter and do their own thing, breakfast and lunch. And I taught my kids like, you know, here's how you make a sandwich. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do this. But dinner was like, okay, we're all coming together. Everybody sits down at the table. We all share this one meal together. But I early on learned that I had just kind of let breakfast and lunch go. I mean, I made sure that my kids ate. Of course I did. But I made that those meals as um, times that they had to be responsible. And then I would check in with them later on, like, hey, what would you eat for breakfast? What would you eat for lunch? Let's talk about that. Okay, if you ate, you know, just a peanut butter sandwich for lunch, maybe we need to add some vegetables in in the afternoon or something like that. And we'd touch base. And that worked really, really well. I also got a tip from another working mom about teaching your kids to do their own laundry. This one, people, is a game changer. Um, and you're going to think, what? when I heard this mom say this, I was like, what? This was a midwife, and she had four kids. And she's like, by the time they were eight years old, they all knew how to do their own laundry. And if you're going like, oh, my word, yeah, I did. I did it, too. So I started when my kids were little and taught them like to fold kitchen towels, to get them used to the idea that, laundry exists, that there is laundry in the world. There's not a magic laundry fairy. So starting around the time my kids were about eight years old, I taught them how to use a washing machine. Like this is the hot, this is the cold. Now I would have them check in, you know, every week. And I'd be like, okay, you know, like my youngest now is 10. And sometimes she'll come down, she'll say, um, can I put these two things together? And I'll be like, no, not a new pair of jeans. And you know, your pink t-shirts. No, not together. And we'll talk about why you can't do that. But Georgia is 10 years old and I have not done her laundry for over a year. And so, and you know, honestly, this is another one. You have to just give up a little bit of control and I encourage them to fold when they put things away. But honestly, for me, it just came down to, I can either have a creative life and business, or I can have my kids have actually Pinterest worthy drawers. 
you know, with perfectly folded clothes. And I chose a creative life. Um, and that actually hasn't been too bad. Interestingly enough, this played out in really interesting ways as my kids got older. So my 22 year old has turned into this like amazing cook. She loves to cook. She's totally like, totally like she can cook way better than I can. Um, she's just an amazing cook and it's her hobby. It's what she does to relax and she loves it. But partly because she was in the kitchen cooking her own breakfast and lunch from the time she was like seven or eight years old. Uh, my other daughter, uh, actually both of my daughters are considered laundry experts among their friends. Um, their friends who don't know how to do laundry are they'll, they'll talk to my daughters and they'll be like, okay, wait, how do you do this? And how do you do this? My daughters will be like, look at the care label. And this is cold, gentle, and this is cool. And this is warm. And this is what happens. And they know about laundry. And so I feel like this is such an important thing because then when your kids do launch, they've got a really strong skill set and all of the mistakes they're going to make, you know, putting the pink t-shirt and the jeans together, they're going to do that at home where you can help them kind of walk through it and go, you know what happens to the best of us. Let's fail here. I was kind of a big proponent of like, if we're going to fail, let's fail at home so that when you get out into the, to the big wide world, like you've got some failure practice under your belt. I felt like that was a really important thing for my kids. Now, so meals is a big one, teach them how. You will put up with a little bit of mess um, and you might have to be sort of strategically planned. So for example, I first taught my kids how to make their own breakfast. And then we focused on the how to clean up after the breakfast. But I tried hard not to overwhelm them with all of it at once. So, you know, there might have been like a month to month period where I dealt with kind of a messy kitchen. Um, uh, but again, always in mind keeping the big picture that I was working at something that I really loved and I was helping give my kids skills and everybody was getting what they needed. Now, the third tip that I have for you, which is a fun one, is vacation toys. Okay, especially if you have kids under the age of, say, eight or nine, you got to do this. Like, do this this week now. Take all your toys, get a bunch of big totes, take all your toys, all the kids' toys, everything. Break it into three totes or two, whichever you prefer. Two groups or three groups, whichever one works better for you. And then you take those groups of toys, either the extra one or two, and you put them away. Go put them in the basement, put them in the garage, put them someplace else. And then in four weeks time, when you have to make that Zoom call for work and you've got to be on the phone and your kids have got to be engaged with something and you do not have the budget to be buying them new toys every week, you pull out the vacation toys. Somebody gave me this tip too. And this again was another lifesaver for me when my kids were little and they knew, and I just would tell them the toys get tired and you know, they're very exhausted from playing with you and they need to go on vacation. And so my kids knew, they, it, my kids could see the totes in my old house, the totes sat on the shelf in the basement. So they could see their toys were there, but they knew that the toys were on vacation. So we talked about how the toys needed a rest and needed a break. And then we bring out those toys and it's literally like Christmas. It's fantastic. So I knew whenever I was on a deadline and I needed a good three to four hours chunk of work, I would pull out the vacation toys and I was like, good. I was like, oh, I'm good. I got four to six hours. You know, these kids are just, these toys are all new. So that's a good one. Um, other things, other tips. Um, I think especially in this time, there's a lot, um, I'm going to kind of zoom out a bit and talk a little bit about moms. There's a lot of information floating around blogs and different things like that. And of course I'm talking at you too about, um, this system or that system or these four things or these 10 things or these seven things or whatever, you know what you do you you know how you organize yourself best. So go with that. Don't try to fit yourself into someone else's mold. I, for example, I am a huge list maker and I actually didn't even understand why I was such a big list maker until I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, eye roll, um, this past year. And it turns out that people with, actually, I prefer autism spectrum condition, um, have very little short-term memory. And so if you tell me something, if I don't write it down, I, I simply forget it. It's like, oh, did you tell me that? No idea. You can ask me 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, an hour later, no idea, unless I write it down. So for me, it's really critical for me. I have to have lists. And the best form for me is still an old fashioned scratch pad and a pen. I have it on my kitchen counter. I have one on my desk. I can jot things down. I'm also a huge fan of Google Keep. 
The one thing I would say with online list features like li um, list apps in your phone, be careful of overwhelming yourself. So like in Google Keep, I have like a weekly task list of the things that I have to get done that week. And then I have more of like a next week as a separate task list. And I also have like a design or I have a projects and ideas list. So when I have a good idea, I stick it in there. And then at the end of the week, I can review that and decide if I want to move anything onto a current task list. But it's really important to feel like you get to the end of your task list, task list and have some sense of completion. So try to break those down. Some people, you know, and also figure out what's what's kind of your maximum tasks that you feel like you can handle. Like if you're just three tasks a day, awesome. Give yourself three. Everything else can wait till the next day. If you're like, oh, I can handle five, okay, do five. If you need to break it down into little bits, that works great too. I did that a lot when my kids were littler. Um, I would take any sort of big thing that felt like a really big overwhelming task and I would break it down to like 15 minute or 30 minute increments. Like, okay, what can I get done on this in just this 15 minutes? Can I move just a little step along getting this task completed? That was really helpful while I had kids. Um, the other thing that I want to kind of finish up and talk about is um, the idea of distraction and your sense of meaning. So for those of us who are work at home moms, either by choice or by COVID, um, we are dealing with a lot of distractions. That is one of the most challenging things about working from home is just all the distractions. You're trying to get something done, bing, the doorbell goes. You're trying to get something done, bing, your, you know, your friend texts you, can the kids play this afternoon? Bing, you're trying to get something done. So. I think what's most important when approaching how you're going to deal with distractions is to first figure out what's your sense of meaning. This is really important. And I think we don't hear enough people talking about this connection between meaning and distractions. So like, for example, my sense of meaning is I derive my sense of meaning by being the best partner and mother that I can be. And my very first priority is always to my family. Now, it may not look like it when I'm like knee deep in making kits or I'm doing a new design or I've got my headphones in or something like that. But whenever I'm working, I'm always thinking about how can my creativity help the community of my family, of my husband and my kids, um, because that's my family community. And so my family is my greatest sense of meaning for me. So this is helpful for me to remind myself of so that when I am knee deep in a design and I'm trying to figure out how to mirror that Melianthus border that's really, really eluding me and Georgia comes running in, my youngest comes running in with something, I have to remind myself this isn't a distraction because this is the overarching meaning of my life. Georgia is the meaning. She's what gives meaning to my life. And yes, my creative work gives me a lot of meaning, but how happy would I be in that creative work without my kids? So it's really important to remember that when we have those distractions, we have to think about how do those fit into our sense of meaning. Now, on the other hand, um, spam callers, oh yeah, do not fit in my sense of meaning. So I will frequently turn my phone on do not disturb and then I mark my kids as priority so I can always get their calls and stuff. And I'll just tell my friends, hey, just so you know, like from, you know, 6 a.m. to noon, like I'm I'm working. So like if you need me, you can text me, but like I'm not going to get that text till noon. So if it's something urgent, like maybe text my husband or email me. That's usually what I tell people because I'm always on my email. So you want to be thinking about why you're doing what you're doing. And I'm a big proponent of the fact that there is meaning in everything. It really it just is all about our perspective. Um and I've come to this. I mean, people look at someone who lives a creative lifestyle and they think, oh, well, you just have so much meaning. You know what? I still have to do laundry, mine, not Georgia's. And I still cook meals and I still clean my house and I still do all these regular daily things. And we have to look for the meaning in everything. I think that's really, really important to look for the sense of meaning and then basically file your distractions accordingly and realize that, okay, maybe I got interrupted. Um, because my kid needed me or needed something, but that that wasn't taking away from my sense of meaning. It was actually part of the greater sense of meaning, because I think that's going to be really important this year for us to just be reminding ourselves that, you know what, we're all in this together. 
We're getting through the best we can. And good enough is good enough this year. Like we need to not like, let's just all let ourselves like not be perfectionists this year because it's just really not the year for perfectionism, I think because we're all getting used to this kind of new way of living. Well, I mean, for me, it's a very, it's a very old way of living because this is how I've always lived my life, uh, at least all of my adult life. And I just want to encourage you to ground yourself in your sense of meaning and recognize it's not forever. And also I would say, feel your feels. You know, if you've got days where you're just plain frustrated, find a constructive way to deal with that. I mean, you know, go outside and scream, you know, or I don't know, find something that's semi-constructive, you know, that's not going to like damage your kids or your, or, or your, the people you love in your life. And we're just going to get through and we're all going to do the best job that we can. So I just want you to know that it can be done. Um, it will be messy. I will let you know that. I would definitely say that my life as a work at home mother is a very messy life. Like, cause there's always something. There's just always something. There's always somebody who needs something or something I didn't plan for or something, you know, I couldn't foresee happened. And it's okay. We're just going to, we're going to just roll with it this year. And we're going to be as kind and good to each other as we possibly can. Oh, that's what I really, really want to see for everyone. So that's just sort of my little bit on working at home with kids in the middle of all this crazy. So I want to thank you all for being with me today. Thank you again. Thank you for everyone who leaves the kind comments on YouTube and all of that. I, I really appreciate it. It is such a joy for me to be sharing this knowledge and information with you. Again, if you want to follow me, best way to find out what I'm up to is subscribe to the newsletter on my website, www.ovalia.life. And I wish you all much joy and a really great start to the school year for those of you who are working moms and all your kids and everyone. And happy stitching.